So today I'm going to give you sort of a big picture update of progress and status and hopefully get you excited about what's to come. So I'm not going to drill down into detail on any particular issue today. I'm going to give a big picture and you'll hear a lot more about a lot of the specific issues in what's coming up. Although probably there'll also be things that we don't drill into that much except for in discussion. Um, to remind you where we are and, and who we are, so we, you know, there's a great group of industry partners, um, most of whom are listed here, uh, supporting this initiative and the way it currently works. So the initiative is the term we use for the, the broad, uh, the whole effort, including all of the science, and then the consortium is the formal uh, pharma funded component or industry funded component. So um, these folks, and we really appreciate you, um, sign an agreement and give money to MOLSI, which serves as a coordinating intermediary and then gives fellowships to folks managed um, by the academics, uh, academic PIs and mostly in these groups. We also have a couple great um, external consultants and we really appreciate everyone's contributions and support, uh, either money or some, in some cases in-kind support. Um, in terms of people. So we're, we're partly, the initiative partly is about getting, I think, us as a field to where we would like to be. Force fields that are really accurate and um, broadly useful. And so some of the types of things that we would, I think a lot of us would like to see in a few years are things where you, know, you could easily take um, be working on a synthetic project, uncover some chemistry that's not covered by a current force field, and almost immediately have a custom force field for that that's going to work very well for your particular chemistry with a minimal amount of uh, computational expertise and time spent. Or dealing with new covalent probes in a chemical biology context, having force fields that can accurately model those. Um, being able to do force field science rapidly where you can compare, let's say a polarizable force field and a fixed charge force field that are fit to the same data and look and see what the, the speed versus accuracy trade-offs of those are gonna be and pick what's gonna work best for your particular target or your particular project. We'd also like to end up where we're not the only ones doing lots of force field fitting. There's many people doing it and we're, force field science is thus able to progress a lot more rapidly. How do we avoid going? Yeah, how do we, yeah, I think that might be a topic, a good topic for discussion. I think uh, the question is how do we avoid going the DF, the way of DFT and just ending up with a bazillion force fields that are highly variable. I think one aspect of that would be that you know, if the force fields that tend to be broadly transferable and broadly useful, that'll at least when I say it connects to, the, connects to the benchmarking infrastructure. If we clearly benchmark everything, we will see the utility and transferability of different things. Yeah, yeah. So let's come back to this in discussion. Um, so the initiative isn't grown up yet, but um, to give you a recap of the history. Chris, after lots of discussions over the years um, about force fields complaints, we finally decided to, do, decided to start doing something about it. And so Chris Bailey arrived in Irvine on sabbatical on June 12th, and I helped him get uh, checked in at the place he was going to be staying, and then immediately my wife went into labor. And so this was the start of a new initiative. Chris arrives, and we have a new baby on this same day. Um, then... You know, progress accelerates as the consortium launched and there was formal funding in 2018. And so now I think we're kind of roughly the same place my daughter is. You know, we've got, we're working on our letters. She's got a book there. And uh, at the same time, we're doing our first full force field refits. So we're maybe not all grown up yet, but, you know, we're not a new one anymore either. Um, so today what I'm going to tell you briefly about I'm going to recap what aspects the Open Force Field Initiative involves, um, tell you some about our progress on automated fitting so far, uh, give brief updates on release one, and this actually says in the next few days, but that's prior to last night when um, Li Peng actually, actually has it ready. So 
um, plans for benchmarking and getting going with it and some thoughts on where we're going. So to remind you what the big picture is in terms of our key parts. So we start with some kind of an initial force field and we have a bunch of infrastructure that's focused on fitting. So we have our open force field toolkit, which is the thing that actually applies a force field, implements the force field specification. And we have a couple of key components that go inside this infrastructure box that are gonna take in data. One of them is um, a parameter optimizer, which currently we use force balance and it's doing a least squares optimization. And then we have something I'll, I'll come back to in a minute, it's called a physical property estimator that can compute uh, condensed phase physical properties like um, densities and dielectric constants and so on. And so we can use this to fit to experimental properties. And then we have the data that we're going to be using. So quantum data that's in QC archive and experimental physical property data. And so the idea is that this, this piece can work essentially independently of a person and produce an optimized force field that then we would assess and maybe the assessment will fill feedback into more fitting or into a release. So those are the key components and you're going to hear a lot more about each of those components in the meeting. Our key infrastructure at this point again involves the open force field toolkit, QC archive, which is where our quantum data is being stored and it's available to the public, force balance, which is our current um, approach for fitting, and that can use data from QC archive and also uh, connect, to the, connect to the condensed phase data. So the property, the property estimator is another key component that the idea is it computes whatever properties that we're interested in, um, condensed phase properties, but potentially even ultimately binding free energies and other things. And it can use that, the property estimator can be used both for just computing those properties, but also with force balance for fitting to those properties. And then there's a variety of other tools we're working on, but those are sort of the core of that automated fitting box. So how are we going on automated fitting? And I'm going to begin this with a recap because I know some people are just joining us or won't remember that clearly. So I'm going to recap where we started. So we started with a new force field format called the Smirnoff format um, that doesn't do traditional atom typing. Instead, it uses substructure searches to assign parameters. And one of the key differences about using a substructure search, in this case with SMARTS or SMERCs, is that instead of having a process where we first take a molecule and we assign types, and then we use the types to look up the parameters, we just take a molecule and do substructure searches on it to assign parameters. So it's a direct parameterization process rather than an indirect process, which ends up make, resulting in some important differences. And that's been published and it's been around for a while. Um, and what Chris Bailey did on his sabbatical and some work in my group continued on was porting Merck Frost Parma Frost force field, which is an extension of Parm 99, a general small molecule force field, ported it into this format. So you could, you could think of Parma Frost as a sibling of GAF. Um, so it's an amber family small molecule force field. When ported into this format and simplified, it has far fewer parameters than permafrost, which has something like 3,600 lines of parameters, whereas here we have about 330. Um, so it's less than one-tenth the size. It removes a lot of redundancy, but at the same time, it also actually covers more chemical space. So when we've applied it um, to a couple of different test sets we were using, this is a zinc subset, this is drug bank, and a significant fraction of e-molecules, we actually cover more of the set. Um, and we've I don't want to belabor this because it's been around for a while, but we benchmarked it on a number of things, including hydration free energies. And basically, we're expecting, um, so this is the Smirnoff versus GAF plot. We're expecting because it's basically a sibling of GAF in a different format, that performance would be roughly comparable to GAF on a wide variety of properties. And that's what we've seen so far. So the, our initial pass was just essentially to make sure we hadn't messed anything up too badly. And it seemed that we hadn't, but we have far fewer parameters. So we thought that meant it's a great place for refitting. So this year we've been busy getting ready 
to do that and actually doing that. So in October was the formal launch of the consortium and we spent a lot of time on infrastructure after that. So our first publication came out here and then we spent you know, a couple months on infrastructure of the basic toolkit, including getting RD kit support in so that people could use our four seals even without an open eye license or as an alternative. Um, a lot of development on QC archive, automated torsion drive pipeline and a bunch of other things. So key toolkit and force field infrastructure. And that overlapped with some data set curation, figuring out which molecules were gonna run through um, our QM torsion drive pipeline, do QM geometry optimizations on, um, and figuring out what physical property data sets we were gonna be using initially. And then we said we'd have this first optimization fit sprint, which is when we actually produce the first refit force field rather rather than a force field that's just a port into our new format. And so what we wanted to do that was, was refit all of the bonds, angles, and torsions, um, and refit Leonard Jones on a selected set of neat liquid properties, and curate some host guest data for use in benchmarking. And so we're, we're here, we're basically, we said we'd be releasing um, a beta of our force field at the beginning of September and we're doing that now. So, and then we're heading into a time period where we're gonna do some assessment of that to see if our refits have improved things or not and um, get a sense of what that's doing to accuracy and for different types of properties. So what we had said we were gonna be doing in year one was releasing and validating the format and the initial set of parameters and get out the toolkit with OpenEye and RDKit support. And so we've done those things. QC Archive platform that, we, that Multi has worked on and we've helped support is out and a lot of our data is in it. We have the property estimator working and it's playing a role in our refits and we have um, refit bond angle and torsion parameters along with selected Leonard Jones. So the last thing on our list um, is just assessment of, whoops, assessment of our first refit force field. So it looks like we should be on track to do that. So I wanna point out that not very much of our time has actually gone into fitting force fields, which is kind of what the point of all the infrastructure work was. So there's this big period from October to end of May where we were just building infrastructure and then some data generation and curation. And then uh, Yudong, I guess in Li Ping's group, you'll, you'll get to hear more about this, but there's been fitting going on for some of June, July and August. And this is more than a dozen refits of the force field already. So it doesn't take a really significant investment of human time anymore for us to refit a force field, which is exactly what we want because then we can make rapid progress. It's a, it becomes a data driven thing rather than a human driven thing. So it's becoming routine. Um, a lot of folks have, have worked on making this possible, but um, I was looking at Yudong's notes or releases and he did a first test refit on May 31st. It was a very limited set of torsions only. And then the next one after that he did, so it was just to make sure infrastructure was starting to work. Then the next one was July 11th using torsions and optimized geometries. And then there's been about a dozen more refits since July 11th. Some of those included adding new science like excluding torsions that had strong internal hydrogen bonds, fixing some issues with chemical perception, fixing some hierarchy problems, freezing angles that were linear, adding new targets like vibrational frequencies, and then most recently bringing in selected Leonard Jones refitting. And so all of that's happened since July 11th. And it's reached the point where this is automated enough that we can do a full refit of the force field to check scientific questions. Like, would we be better off with changing the chemical perception in this way? Well, let's try that and refit the whole force field and see what that does to accuracy um, on the, the training set. So benchmarking comes later. Um, so that's really, really helpful to us. Instead of having to guess whether something is gonna improve things and just do it, we just get to try it. 
So our force fields are going to be have normal names or boring names um, like OpenFF 1.0, and they're going to also have code names after herbs. And so our first one is going to be called Parsley. And um, so the names are going to be OpenFF dot x or x dot y dot z, where x is basically the functional form, um, and y is the phase we're in of refitting, and then z is the fix. So the first one is Parsley. Um, and so this is available as of last night, though, over the course of the meeting, it should get a little bit more accessible. Right now, it's a little bit uh, hidden in a, a tarball somewhere, but you can get at it if you want it now. Um, but it should, by the, by the end of the weekend, should be really easy to get. Um, so, you know, it's used this infrastructure we built to refit essentially all the bonds, angles, and torsions, except for some very, very unusual chemistry that's hard to cover with, with our data. And um, we've refit a selected set of Leonard Jones to condensed phase properties, density, and heat of vaporization at this point. Part of the Leonard Jones refit goal at this point was just to make sure our infrastructure is working properly for that. And so we've done it in a pretty limited way for pure solids only. We're ready to extend to mixtures and out to other properties, but we're not doing that yet. Uh, we think just Leonard Jones. Just Leonard Jones. Just Leonard Jones. Oh, yeah. I can repeat questions. The question was are we doing pairwise Leonard Jones or just standard Leonard Jones? And the answer is just standard Leonard Jones. Okay, and Mike's grabbing the mic. Um, so we'll see what happens in terms of accuracy from this. We think that the whole force field will be an improvement because it certainly seems to be a significant improvement on the data we're fitting to. Um, and, but most importantly for us, it's a proof of principle and prep for subsequent releases as we start being able to fold in more and more data. And especially on the Leonard Jones, we'll be able to refit to um, additional properties. So but still, we, we think that people will we hope that people will see improvements in accuracy already. We'll find that out soon. And in terms of what QM data we're using, um, uh, Daniel Smith and others, including Yuyong, have put a great amount of effort into this. Uh, the QC, Mulsi, um, Mulsi's quantum chemistry uh, resources that we're relying on for this, there's um, QC portal that allows us to interact with QC fractal, which is the, the workflow engine basically. And we can run a lot of um, compute on our clusters from that. And then the results get deposited in QC archive where we can pull them down and use them for fitting. And we don't really have to worry about where the data lives. It just is easily retrievable. So our data sets in QC archive, we now have about 2,400 torsion drives 170,000 geometry optimizations, 50,000 Hessians, and something like 3.4 million gradient evaluations. Um, we're not using all of that in fitting yet. So some of this is much, it goes significantly beyond what we're fitting to at this point, and we'll likely be drawing on some of it in testing. Um, but it's a significant amount of data. All the torsion drives is worth noting so far are, whoops, that bullet point is incorrect. All the torsion drives so far are on molecules that are fragment size, so whole molecules. We haven't done fragmentation of larger molecules yet, but the fragmentation of larger molecules, automated fragmentation is essentially ready. So we're gonna be doing that very soon. So we have a good set of data. Um, I'll give you a couple, a peek into some of the data. So the very first uh, set we ran through was um, what we call the Roche set, so a set of uh, fragments or molecules submitted by Roche, and here are some of them. It's 468 molecules, and these are all small enough that we're doing 1D torsion profiles on them um, without fragmentation. So we ended up with 798 1D torsion prof profiles. We have 936 optimized geometries, 660 vibrational frequencies. So that's the, the first set we used. And there's some code here at the bottom that you can't quite see, but would show you how to retrieve that data from QC Archive. Um, we also have a second set of molecules I'll show you. 
there's like a couple torsion, do you just run one independently and then run the other one and then say that's it? That's what we're doing right now. So we have the ability to do 2D torsional scans, but we haven't done many of them so far because of the cost, but we're going to be looking at that. Or n-dimensional torsion scans more generally. Yeah. And I know Li Ping has done some of that for some of the force fields he's fit in the past. So we're not doing that yet, but we can do that. Um, right. Okay. And then, so the coverage set, um, an undergrad in my group, Brian Tanaka, did um, essentially a greedy set cover on E molecules to try to find the smallest number of molecules below a certain size that would use all of our parameters. And then we ran those through. So we just wanted to make sure we had at least some molecules that would cover essentially all the parameters in the force field. So um, we've run those through. And so for those, it's, it's a rather small set of molecules. I think it's a little under 100. We have 417 one new torsion profiles, 831 optimized geometries, and 235 vibration frequencies. And here's some of those molecules. Um, so some of them have rather unusual chemistry because we're trying to make sure that even our very oddball parameters get exercised. Um, so that data is available. Then also there's condensed phase data. So um, the goal here was mainly to test the infrastructure. We're not necessarily expecting to do a, to, to see major changes with respect to, or of Leonard Jones parameters, but we wanted to make sure it would work. Um, so Here's, so we have uh, a data set of 58 data points with 30 molecules we're fitting to pure solvent properties, just density and heat of vaporization at this point. Um, and these are the parameters, you can't see one at the bottom, but these are the how much data we have for each of our parameters in this set. Uh, we don't cover all the parameters, we cover a subset of them, but these are the ones that are covered. So um, here's how many, how many data points we have for each. And so this is the, largely the work of Simon Boothroyd, who's here. Um, and here's some of the compounds involved. It do, they don't cover some core cases that you would expect. So we're drawing from this thermo ML. And thermo ML is relatively new. So it turns out it has some gaps with respect to data that compounds that you would naively expect to have. Like, for example, they don't have densities and heat of vaporization for benzene and certain other compounds like that. So we're gonna to have to curate some of that data from elsewhere. Um, but this is what was in our first set of compounds. And so we do have some interesting things there, but some gaps. Um, currently we're using M1 BCC charges for everything. So that's supported in both cheminformatics toolkits and Likely there will be support for some new charge model and new BCCs coming soon. And you'll hear about that later on. Um, we're not fitting to dielectric constants yet. That's something that we are very interested in, but we expect that's gonna be more important and more helpful once we have the ability to also adjust BCCs. Um, so with, I think there's science questions that need answering about what will result in the best accuracy and predictive power. Um, so automated refitting, great, but does it actually work? Um, so I want to, we, we'll start off with a quick sanity check. Um, so Chris had pointed out in June that uh, he thought he had a mistake or error in the bond length for ethers. Uh, so this is what he said, it has egregiously short length 1.370. Could we please, it to, please change it to 1.430? So we said, no, let's see what happens when we refit it. Um, so here's the refit value for that, and so Chris is the wizard. Um, and actually the first refit was 1.430. Subsequent refitting changed it, so now he's off by 0 0.004. Um, and Trevor in my group also noticed the same thing. So, you know, originally we were looking at um, 1.37, which is for esters, but if you look at this, this is some torsion drive data. Uh, for a variety of different compounds. And if you histogram it, here's what the bond lengths look like. And so, yeah, we're seeing 1.442 or 1.43 being more consistent with, with this. Um, yep, good question. Yeah, 
It depends on, and I'll just throw this at you, Don't minute. The question is, why, wall clock time, how long does the refit take? It depends a lot on which data we're fitting to. So if you refit, including the Leonard Jones, you're gonna be taking insipid days. But if you're doing it just to the, just the bonds, angles, and torsions, it, my number is hours. Do you have a more exact number? <coughs> 20 hours. Yeah. So, so this is the condensed phase. Right, right. Yeah, Simon, do you, what's the condensed phase looking at right now? So condensed phase fitting currently taking a day or a day and a half, depending on the resources. Okay. Um, we, are, do, we are seeing improvement in torsion profiles. So I'm gonna show a couple of these. They have some info on the bottom about which parameter it is and which, uh, what the molecule is. And then the smirks count at the bottom, which you can barely see is 38. So that's how many times we use this parameter in the set. So this is showing one plot of one molecule, but there's 38 times this is used. And so orange is where we were originally, green is where we are after optimization, not just to this molecule, across all 38 molecules, and blue is the quantum. So we're seeing an improved profile here. Here's another example um, where we're looking at uh, sulfur carbon bond rotation in a couple of different molecules that I've shown there. And so again, orange is original, blue is quantum, green is new. Julia has um, a question. Of course. <laughs> um, you're fitting to um, quantum chemistry gas phase data, yep. right? Yeah. So you shouldn't expect to get exactly on top of them, Indeed. should you? Okay. Per probably not. We're, at this point, everything is pretty consistent with how these have historically been fit. So. There's a lot of science questions one might want to answer about what if you don't do that. Mm -hmm. um, and oh yeah, so there's a link there at the bottom. You can get all of these plots yourself and browse through them if you like. There's also clear improvements in other parameters. So these are plots that look at quantum value for a particular bond length versus mm value for that bond length. Orange is before refitting, blue is after refitting. There's a lot of changes and improvements. Um, so you'd like them to correlate along that dashed line and at least, and if they're not gonna correlate along the dashed line, at least to be, have the dashed line pass through the data. So you can, if you want, you can browse through the exact changes to the parameters. Here are equilibrium angle parameters for equilibrium angle values and changes in values for certain angles. Um, you're not supposed to make much of that data other than that there are some changes. Some of the parameters, they're sorted in order of which ones change the most. So some of them change a significant amount, some don't. Here's force constants for bonds, for example. All this data is in, in there. Um, the Leonard Jones refitting does also result in some parameter changes, the largest being for chlorine at this point. Um, and it's not a refit of all of our parameters, it's just some of them, but um, we're seeing relatively modest changes in these, which we think is probably good. Yeah, so the, le the, the, le the left-hand legend or the bottom legend? What's that? Oh, the colors, yeah. So um, red is a decrease, so the blue is the <coughs> So you don't, is it blue is new? The blue is the original. So green, if you have a green bar that's taking you up to the new value, red is down. Um, and, but our data also does show the need for improved what we call chemi chemical perception or essentially typing. This is um, some data that Trevor in my group generated or happened to pull from QC archive. This is just looking at torsion, um, so the horizontal axis is torsional angle versus bond length. And so this is for many molecules that happen to use the same parameter. But the, the sort of series along the horizontal axis are as you drive a torsion. So what you can see if you histogram this data is there's basically three peaks in the bond length distribution. And you know, right now, this is the current parameter value. 
but we're basically seeing three kinds of chemistry grouped together in the same bond parameter. And um, so presumably one can get better values for this if you split out these three aspects of three different chemistries. Um, there's a lot of that type of thing going on. We'll need to dig into that eventually. Part of what we eventually want to do is automatically be able to split out different chemistries from this type of data, but that's not ready yet. Yeah, that needs to be worked out too. The question was, how do you avoid overfitting? Um, I mean, look, partly I think Bayesian techniques can help with that, and that's something we'll come back to later in this meeting, but there's a lot of it. science to be done there. So you see things like this, and it's clear that you need to do it but then how do you fully automate that? There's a lot of work to be done. That is so good. That lady Spears, did that show up? <laughs> Chris, Chris says, that's so good. I've waited years to see this showing up in a general way. Okay. He's gonna hand you the, we're gonna hand you the mic so you can say that again. <laughs> for the recording and for the people who are not here. Uh, I, I was just saying, uh, this is so good just to see this graph that you, you don't have to be somebody in a back room trying to guess that there's three different kinds of chemistry wrapped up here. We, don't, we won't even have to guess what the chemistry is because Kemper will just sort it out. It'll just be taken care of in, in a timely fashion. And, and I've been waiting years to be able to see this science just put out so plainly like that. So I, I guess I should just thank everybody. I guess this is kind of like one of the, like this is, has a bit of just about everybody involved in it to get this graph. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so we weren't looking for this at the time, but it happened to come out of the data. So next comes benchmarking. Um, so benchmarking, we've done a lot of work for, on infrastructure for fitting force fields. We haven't done much work yet on infrastructure for benchmarking force fields, other than that the property estimator works just as well to calculate things as to fit to them. So we can use that. Um, the short-term benchmarks that we want to do and need to work on automating are energetics relative to QM on data that we're not fitting to, physical property estimation for pure solvents, we can do those estimates, but we have to pick the data. Density, heat of vaporization, probably dielectric constants, and those are already available in the property estimator. Uh, we can do physical property estimation for mixtures, like enthalpy of mixing and excess density. And we can do host guest binding. We, uh, David Hahn, who's here, is a new, right there, he's waving his hand, thank you. Um, he's a new open force field postdoc at Janssen. And he's going to be working on benchmarking on protein ribbon binding. Um, we just talked with Vitas Gapsis from Bert de Groot's group, um, who has done a bunch of benchmarking of protein ligand binding with GAF and CJNFF and the other force field that shall not be named, and um, has a pretty automated workflow that can run through the whole JAX set plus a few other sets they've curated, pre-prepared protein ligand systems. So it's just not benchmarking preparation, just benchmarking binding free energies, using relative free energies and, and also non-equilibrium techniques. So they can run all of that, they get the numbers out, and he's interested in running his whole set of benchmarks with the Smirnoff small molecule force field as well. So we think that will work great as a first pass because we can just run ours through it and be able to compare with those other options already. But um, David will be and has been in touch with a number of folks already about longer term benchmarking plans. Um, also, there's other things we could benchmark on. Um, I think you, know, you can give us some input on that. Also, we'd love to have you guys try it out on your favorite tests and see how it does and see what, what issues there are. Another thing we could potentially benchmark on are strain energies of CSD structures that could be really interesting. I know they have um, expressed interest in the possibility of releasing some of their data openly that could allow us to do that. Um, so host guest binding, Dave Slotchauer, who's here, has done some nice work looking at Smirnoff 99 Frost performance on binding free energies for host guest systems. 
combining Enthalpy as the post-guest systems and comparing that to GAF. And so I think that that's basically working in the property estimator and we should be able to use that on our new releases also. Potentially that could eventually be used for fitting this type of data also. We don't know if that's going to be a good thing or not. Um, so those are different chemical series binding to this. The three colors are different chemical series binding to the same host. And I think we'll get to questions pretty soon so people can ask a lot more of those. Um, and uh, yeah, so he uses a technique for binding free energies that from the Gilson lab called attach-pull release. And um, so that's in the property estimator. So ideally, what would we benchmark? We'd benchmark GAF and or GAF2. We'd benchmark Smirnoff 99 Frost, which is our starting point, and then our beta or release candidate with the Leonard Jones refit and without the Leonard Jones refit, because this is a pretty le limited Leonard Jones refit done primarily to ensure that our machinery is working. So we don't necessarily expect it will make things better. Um, and so then I mentioned the protein ligand binding which should get us comparison with some other force fields that we are not ourselves running. And we hope that you'll begin using this in your own favorite tests in the next, in the coming weeks and get back to us on what you're seeing. And you can use our force fields now and the release candidate is gonna be soon Conda installable. So we should be able to be getting out announcements as soon as that's ready. Um, you know, to prepare a system is super easy. If you have a molecule you'd like to parameterize, it's really just this. You just import the force field, you import molecule, you create a molecule out of, let's say, a mol2 file, you assign the force field using this line, then you make a topology out of it and you create an open MM system. And from that open MM system, you can easily export to Amber or Gromax format, or you can go on to use it in open MM. You'd use the positions um, when, you're, when you're doing that. I would point out that if you're starting, I forgot to put it on this slide, but if you're starting, if you're using RDKit, the RDKit back engine, uh, back end rather than the OpenI one, you should be starting not from a MOL2 file because RDKit's MOL2 support is pretty bad. So you'd probably want an SDF file. Um, Ross? Here's a mic. And the question is, is it feasible to have create um, Amber system, create Gromax system? Yes, it is. We haven't done that yet because we felt like that kind of makes us responsible for the thing that creates them, which is Parmed, which is not something we're currently funded to work on. So, but it's two or three lines of Python to do it. And there's examples of it. So if we can, do, we could do that. We just worry that people will blame us for Parmed problems then. If you go back one slide, sorry. Yeah. The um, how do you, what's the process for doing the LJ refit? You do all the Leonard Jones from the solvent simulations and then refit all the torsion subsequent to that. Right. So currently, what we do is we refit all the bonds, angles, and torsions once because we did that first, and then we refit the Leonard Jones condensed phase properties, and then we go back and refit the bonds, angles, and torsions again. Of course, they don't change very much at that point, but the torsions change more than anything else. One thing we'll explore eventually is what happens if we refit simultaneously, because we can do that, but it's unclear whether that would be a good thing or not. Wait for the mic, wait for the mic. Uh, follow up is uh, what happens to the charges after the LJ kit? Okay, so right now we're not doing anything with the charges. So we, we just have M1BCC charges, they stay M1BCC charges. So eventually those will be able to change as part of the refit, but not yet. Um, so how will your infrastructure deal with uh, users who may want to fit the force field to molecules they cannot release publicly? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, actually, there's a slide on that in a minute, sort of, or part of the slide. Okay, so that okay and there's examples there if you need them um so then i'm going to really quickly talk about some other new directions that 
are exciting science, future science directions. One of them is that we, if we're doing something like an M1 BCC calculation to assign charges, we get the Weiberg bond orders, some kind of a bond order, essentially for free from that. And there's a couple of big benefits of that. One, that can simplify handling of resonance structures, remove dependence on aromaticity model because you can determine from that what's aromatic or not. But then also, as Hayes Stern has shown, um, if you have a series of, let's say, biphenyls like these, depending on what's the distant chemistry, you can have a really significantly different bond order for that nominally rotatable bond between them. And it turns out the barrier height for rotating that bond basically seems to depend linearly on the bond order, which I think we think raises really exciting possibilities for the for simplifying torsions considerably based on parameter interpolation. So instead of having to have, let's say, a separate torsional profile, as you change the distant chemistry here, you could perhaps get by with just one or two torsional profiles with a barrier height that scales. Yeah, so the, the AM1 is only getting us the bond order here. Um, and But that's something we'd have to investigate is whether we need a better bond order than an AM1 bond order. Um, but, the, but the torsional profile is not coming from AM1 in this case. Okay. Yeah, and so we're not using it for the torsion profile, just for the rough bond order, but yeah. But that, um, that comes also from the um, optimized geometry, right? To yeah. some extent, and, yeah. that, and that's being done um, in the process that you're using. Yes. You're optimizing the geometry before you get the charges. Yes. So these things are all interconnected. Right, they are. Okay. So yeah, so they've been looking some at that, and, but that's something that before we would throw this type of thing into production, we'd have to carefully look at those issues, whether AM1 is gonna be enough. Um, okay, wait for the mic. Uh, what I think is so exciting about this, just in terms of the direction of the force field development, uh, is that when you think of what's happening with that barrier, how would you make a torsion in any force field, general force field that we know of that would accommodate that? It's got to somehow know about the distal chemistry. And whether atom types or fragments, that is a horrible, horrible land war. By, by this beautiful method that uh, Chai has been working on, I mean, we can get a property and use it to, within the context of a general force field to capture that degree of variability in the torsion angle. And that will be, I think, a first. Um, then also, I'm going to go through this quickly, but we've been looking some at nitrogen parameterization or planarity, and here's a range of molecules, some of which are flat, some of which are tetrahedral, and some which are in this gray band in between, which is intermediate. Um, Victoria Lim and my group has done this, and it turns out that you can actually make pretty good headway towards telling how flat or tetrahedral a particular chemical series is going to be as you change the distal chemistry by looking at the bond order. So here are graphs of improper angle as a function of bond order for this series, these molecules here, and this is for these molecules here. This all, there's a lot more that needs to be done to work all of this out, but we at least know there's a really strong correlation, which potentially could allow us to predict how planar or tetrahedral something is going to be doing without needing a separate atom type for each. Longer term, we, uh, there's also the avenue of improved electrostatics, specifically virtual sites in a number of places. Some years ago with Dave Cerruti and, and Bill and Julia and others, we looked at um, needing, needing off-site charges for some carbon-chlorine bonds and how that improved the electrostatic potential. That's not something we support in our current force fields, but it's a, an interesting direction for future science that you can help us prioritize. And also you'll hear, I think, some about uh, potential work on um, graph convolutional networks for fast scalable charge assignment that are, is purely graph-based. 
Mike Schauperl has been working on um, high quality bespoke charges from a next generation REST approach. And I won't get to walk through some of his details of his data here, but sort of the upshot is that um, you can, it can improve predictions of things like hydration, free energies, and dielectric constants. And um, could be if you're after really high quality charges for a particular molecule of interest, rather than something like MDCC, it can be really interesting for that. Um, also, Jessica and my group is working on improved improper parameters generally, and then especially for nitrogens to capture uh, how planar or tetrahedral or intermediate they are. And that should get folded into a, a, a force field coming relatively soon. A lot of other things to do. Expanding how many types we have and, and expanding chemistry coverage of chemical space. Bespoke parameterization of torsions. So to get to Julian Michel's issue, um, what about if somebody has a proprietary molecule, they want to make sure that the parameters are really high quality and they can't show it to us. Um, we're working on getting somebody to build bespoke torsion parameterization workflows so they can run that internally and make sure that their parameters are gonna be high quality without telling us about the molecule. Um, then there's work to be done generating quantum chemical data and making sure we have the right data and are using it in the right way and on experimental data sets for fitting. Um, and then eventually things like parameter optimization based on Bayesian inference. And that's something we'll come back to. But I wanna remind everybody, both people outside and especially even people inside that the website is key for news and status and reports on what's going on. So we have these science updates on our website and that's so that everybody, including our team, can stay informed about what the other aspects of the initiative are doing, because it's important that we see how our parts are going to fit together with the other pieces. So to wrap up, we hope you like our Parsley release. Um, we're really excited not as much about the re release as the fact that now we can do rapid refits, so we can explore lots of new science and we can hopefully rapidly improve the quality of force fields. Um, this likely creates opportunities for spin-off science, maybe internships in your companies, rotation projects in our own groups, different things like that where somebody can experiment with what happens if we try this or if we try that and let that contribute to advancing science. The things that work well can get folded back into releases, things that don't can, um, don't have to. And you know, we're seeing clear improvements in our parameters already, so we hope that means that when, as we go into benchmarking, that results in accuracy gains for properties we care about, but we're going to find out soon. And I tried to show pictures of people who were doing this as I went along. Um, I don't think I can even remember all of the people who uh, to thank, but some of them were there, and you can see a list of our members on the website. We're also in great debt to a lot of people over the years, all of you, um, the Amber community, GAF, and NIH and NSF funded earlier work that helped pave the way for this. So thanks again for your time. We had some questions on the way, but I think there's some, some time for you. Um, so, so David, uh, just wondering, how will you avoid in the future to have an uh, an explosion of force field that you, you have to benchmark all of them. Every time you make a new one, you have to go back. Are you going to benchmark with the previous one to know if you're really improving? So that's not something we've totally worked through yet. As far as us having an explosion of force field, what we'll probably, I would guess we'll be doing is probably benchmarking the newest one and the last one. And as long as we're making headway, that's going to be all we're needing because if every step is better than the one before, we don't have to keep going testing the ones, the older ones. But in terms of an explosion of force fields, actually my hope is that there will be sort of an explosion of force fields from other people who are using some of the same infrastructure to try new things. And they'll use our same benchmarking infrastructure to benchmark theirs. And then we'll all get to find out what's best. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that to say that because we're building the automated benchmarking infrastructure and because you, know, you folks are supposed to guide us on what we should be comparing against, then we could have the force fields against force fields uh, challenge essentially online um, benchmarking all the things that you care about. So that's why it's so important for us to get the things that people do care about into those benchmarks.
you mentioned that for, for the release one, basically most angles, torsions and bonds are fitted except for some unusual chemistry. Can you give an example for the unusual chemistry you need? I'd actually have to dig really deep. So it's basically things that we can't find in new molecules at all. Um, and I don't off the top of my head remember any of those things because they seem very strange to me. Yeah, chromium hexafluoride, sure. Um, yeah, I know, but I also, you know, obviously we're not refitting monovalent ions at present. Do we have a sense how much more calculation or QM calculation we need to cover a broader space? For example, if we take Kimball or um, additional chemistry. Yeah. Um, so the easy part is so the easy part is the quantum calculations. And I don't think that many more because doing something like this greedy set cover, you don't you just need, you know, a few molecules that utilize each parameter at least to be able to fit it. Um, the harder part is things that require an expansion of the typing um, because we don't fully have an automated, we don't have an all fully automated machinery for doing that yet. So somebody needs to say, oh, well, let's introduce some new type here. Um, now that's something we want to do, but it's not hmm. online yet. So, so when I mentioned coverage, that doesn't necessarily mean it's available like you displayed earlier, more about their all high quality parameters. You know, yeah. even compared with OPS3, it's starting yeah. from 40,000 torsion to 150,000 torsion. Yeah. That's yeah, so we don't, we don't know that much about assessment of parameter quality yet. Yeah, if some of the work you guys have done on, on that in the context of your own torsion initiative is portable, that could be something we could perhaps draw on. And that's part of the role that benchmarking needs to play is to help us start learning how to know which ones are quality and which ones aren't. Um, I had a question concerning the progress in the fitting. Um, when the parameters changed, I assume that the bars represented what happened after 14 iterations. So are those converged changes or how do they change in between each of the iterations? Um, can somebody pass the mic to you, Dong? I'm going to throw it to you, Dong. Um, so from my understanding, um, the question is, how does the change happens during the uh, fitting over the iterations? Yeah, your 14 iterations or so, are they fully converged? Um, yes, so uh, force balance does this um, uh, optim optimization with um, um, Hessian um, gases and uh, uh, trial steps. So uh, what end up happening is that um, uh, in the first two iterations, most of the improvements are done. And the rest of the iterations are just uh, um, uh, small steps that try to uh, um, get small improvements done. And uh, it finally converged after we met um, two thresholds. One of them is the step size on the parameters, and one of them is the um, change in the objective function we are fitting is below a threshold, then it converges. 